I learned that I'm not here to sell the people, I'm here to educate the people, right? So when I bid on a cold call, I'm completely interrupting whatever that business owner is doing, right? And at that time, they have one or two options. They can hear what I have to say, or they can just get off the phone and go, hey, you're wasting my time. When I first started cold calling, that was something that was weighing on my mind heavy, right? right? Um, what if I get rejected? What if he says no? You know, as I grown and I continue to build on that and build on my mental toughness, I had to realize that he wasn't trying to get me off the phone. I just wasn't providing enough value that it made sense for him to continue on the conversation with me. You're listening to Ecomonics, a Debutify podcast, your resource for one of a kind insights into the world of e-commerce and business in the modern age. This is Joseph. I'll be presenting a wealth of industry knowledge from interviews with successful business people and our own state-of-the-art research. Your time is valuable, so let's go. Bernardo da Vinci, it is good to have you here in Ecomonics. How are you doing today? How are you feeling? Life is good, man. Thank you for having me on the podcast today. Happy to be here. I, I believe it. Life is good. Challenging at times, you know, been a challenging year for a lot of people, but like a lot of the people I've talked to really took advantage of the of the last year. And I and I have a feeling that the same is the, can be said for you, too. Yeah, definitely. There was definitely a lot of adversity to overcome. 2020 pandemic affected a lot of people in many different ways, many different aspects it affected them from, you know, a financial standpoint. Some people lost money. Some people capitalized on the opportunity and definitely seen their e-commerce uh, Shopify in particular, boom, especially with a bunch of new first time online shoppers in the marketplace for the first time last year, definitely seen a huge exponential growth. Yeah. Um, just while I was um, uh, usually when I look into people's content, I check out their YouTube and the algorithm wanted me to watch this video from the Joe Rogan uh, experience where somebody is saying how much money Disney loses every day it's closed. I'm like, that is a seven minute video. There's going to be a lot to unpack about just how much money they're losing there. So you know, it's, uh, it is unfortunate, but it's, as always, business is a call to adapt and to be ready to deal with what is currently going on in the industry as it, as it unfolds organically. And so, you know, props to everybody for, for however they found their ways to adapt. So all of that warm up out of the way. First question I got to ask you is what you do, what you're up to these days. Oh, easy. Um, so what I'm working on these days is I I mainly focus, I got three Shopify stores running right now. I got a couple of VAs that's managing right now. I'm more so on the investor side. So I'm just investing in the ad spend. Whereas, you know, I get the customers from social media, Facebook, Instagram. I'm starting to get into the concept of using Google and YouTube more, but my bread and butter is definitely Facebook and Instagram. Then I have my VAs fulfill the orders for me, as well as reach out to the suppliers. At one point, when I first started my Shopify during 2016, I was using AliExpress, but now I've been able to partner with different types of um, sourcing manufacturers and um, different things along that nature. My journey has definitely been um, definitely been a roller coaster ride over the last five years. But aside from me working on Shopify, I also have my own social media marketing agency, which I'm sure we'll get into later on the podcast. And um, yeah, man, it's definitely been a productive productive period of time this year. Yeah. So first thing that stuck out to me is just you're transitioning from getting a product directly from AliExpress into the uh, arrangements that you have now. Now, I know commonly um, the people that I talk to don't uh, want to reveal too much, which totally understandable. Um, but it is a really important thing to talk about because a lot of people look at what they can pull off if they were to sell things on AliExpress these days and they're bogged down by a month long, two month long wait times. I ordered something from uh, from one of my colleagues store two months ago and I still haven't even gotten yet. So that the, for all we know, the supplier doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> so there, yeah. there's all sorts of things that go wrong. So I, I did want to hear a little bit more about that is what, um, how, how would you describe the relationship you have right now with the products that you're selling and how you got, uh, you got those arrangements? Yeah, so let me take you back in time real fast. So back in 2016, 2015, that's when I really found out about Shopify and AliExpress as a whole. Um, and what I was doing back then when I was in my beginner phases, I was just sourcing from AliExpress. Um, sometimes Alibaba, but Alibaba, when I first started, it was just it was just like um, it was challenging for me just because I know AliExpress and Alibaba is owned by the same guy, I believe, named Jack Ma, but just 
and Alibaba, you have to order in bulk. And at that time, I wasn't as stable in my Shopify business. So I just stuck with AliExpress. But um, the way how I transitioned fast forwarding from 2016 to 2021 is the greatest resource that I was able to get was a um, uh, VA. VA. Um, but what I mean by a VA is someone who works on AliExpress. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, not, I'm using the wrong terms. Not a VA. It's a drop shipping agent. That's the right okay. term. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry for the confusion. Anybody listening? But I was able to get a drop shipping agent who can go inside these manufacturer buildings and already go, hey, this drop shipping is bringing X amount of volume weekly, monthly. Let's just go ahead, get these orders on standby. And then when I had to come place the orders, I just let him know. And then he'll just send everything out for me, giving me way faster shipping times than, you know, what you just mentioned the 30 days. Right now, our shipping times is about seven through 12 business days. But yeah, that just came with time and experience and a lot of negotiations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think for uh, a lot of people in my position, just starting out, uh, I would say the most attractive method is to uh, get in touch with the uh, 3PL. Um, I, the one I talked to um, uh, Simone of uh, Yakify, and you know they're Italian, I'm Italian, so there was a part of me I just wanted to like, you know, uh, I'd be there for my people uh, as well. Yeah. Um, are, are, are you with Bernardo da Vinci? That's is, is that Italian? Like that is Italian, but uh, is is that your is that your nationality? No. Um. So I actually got that name. That's a nickname that was given nickname. to me okay. when, yeah, when I was working at a job just back in 2013. A guy, um, I think his name was Quinn. We was working at Burger King, right? And he was like. Man, the way how you just articulate things in your mind and the way how you kind of get it come to fruition, you like Da Vinci, like Leonardo Da Vinci, except you're Bernard. So we just gonna call you Bernardo Da Vinci. And I thought it was cool at the time. So I just I just been running with it ever since. All right, yeah, uh, uh, fair, fair enough. It was like I, I talked to uh, way, way back, I talked to Apple Kreider, and I'm like, okay, okay, I'm pretty sure his parents didn't name Apple, but I just gotta find out just in case. Was Bernard Da Vinci, I was like, okay, hang on a second, I gotta ask about that one. Um, so, anyways, the point that I was <laughs> making is that with um, with three PL, the reason why I think for starters, the reason why three PL is an attractive option is because I don't have very much leverage. I haven't sold anything yet, uh, but I am willing to put money down into it. So, by working with a three PL, I can purchase the products, have them sent to the warehouse there, cut down on the on the wait times, have it shipped. Bob's your uncle. Um, so with uh, with your arrangement, did you have to have like a certain amount of leverage in order to have your dropshipping agent to be able to uh, advocate for you effectively? Yeah. So in the beginning phases, like in the early testing phases, um, the drop, my agent, they wanted to see what I could produce before, you know, we begin a negotiation with them and the manufacturer. So at the time I was getting um, maybe five, 10 orders a week if I was lucky. And he was like, all right, so if you're going to, you know, work with us, we're going to need you to increase that volume. So at that time, I was just doing strictly Instagram. This is, this had to be around 2016, 2017. That's when Instagram influenced like the big traffic, traffic source for Shopify dropshipping. So I had the genius idea. I said, if I can do this with Instagram influencers, um, I just have to be patient enough to take this data take this investment that I'm using with them and invest that in the Facebook ads. And anyone knows who invests in Facebook ads is trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. You got to test multiple products to get something to work. But then once I found a winner, right, because all it takes is one product to change your life, um, I started doing like 50 orders a week. And then that's when my dropshipping age is like, okay, we can work with this type of momentum. We can work with this type of volume. Let me go back to the manufacturer and see what we can work out. Okay, I see. So the, yeah, the dropshipping agent was just waiting on to see if uh, uh, waiting for the winner, just as uh, in the same that you were too. Okay, that checks out. So we we got most of uh, what you're up to, um, at least uh, as far as the e-commerce space goes. But I also know that you're you know you're you're a musician as well, uh, a rap yes. artist. So we got that. Oh, um, I'll. I'll We'll get into that because there are some questions I do have associated about that too. I just want the audience to uh, get the full scope of uh, what you're up to. So with all of that, the uh, next thing I want to know is what got you into e-commerce. You said at one point you were uh, you were at Burger King. So, you know, yeah. I, a lot of people are at Burger <laughs> King and they're they're inspired to go do something else. Uh, granted, some people actually really like it there. They become managers, more power to them. Uh, but yeah, uh, tell us your story, how you found e-commerce or in some cases, how it found you. Yeah, so... My journey begins, let's just start from Burger King. So I was working at Burger King back in 2013. And I was, at the time, I was real ambitious about what I was doing because I was young. I was I was 21. So I was just, 
uh, fresh, I want to say fresh out of high school, but I've been out of high school for at least a year or two. I was considering going to college. I said, all right, if I don't go to college, I'm just giving me a job. And, you know, whatever happens from there, goes on from there. But I was from at Burry King from 2013 until about 2016. In 2016, I got a job being a teacher, right? So I was actually teaching other people's kids, um, giving out the lesson plans, you know, doing the basics, English, math, science, history, things along that nature and whatnot. And during my time in 2016, um, I was watching a YouTube video, like anyone else who probably listened to this podcast. And Shopify was a topic that popped up and it piqued my interest because I've always been interested in how the internet has impacted us as humans throughout the many decades that we've been alive in human history, uh, especially from, you know, I'm, I'm a 90s baby. So from the 90s on up, you know, I've always been interested in that. And, you know, I was watching all these different YouTubers talking about how this impacted them, how Shopify was changing their lives, so on and so on. And, you know, at the time I was still working my job. I was like, OK, so maybe I could manage this while I'm also working on building my own business, because I have a strong belief in myself. If I don't see a future in something, I'm not going to invest much time in it, let alone invest a bunch of resources into it. So I wanted to make sure in my mind that I was 100 percent certain that I wanted to go all in on this. And, you know, I stuck with it. I won't lie to anyone listening. It took me two, two and a half years before I seen any type of success. Like what I was just talking about with the agent. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I just stuck with it. I trusted my gut and I just kept educating myself to the best of my ability so that I knew one day that I would be able to reach the peak of the mountain and I'd be able to, you know, put my flag on it, like on top of Mount Everest or something. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 somewhere in there, and and again, I feel bad for not uh, having figured this out uh, prior to, but uh, the boss man, um, uh, Ricky Hayes, he reached out to you. He said, you know, hey, come uh, come check out this this theme. So you've been with uh, you you've been using Debutify longer than I have, that's for sure. Um, so I guess one thing I also want to know is just how people were making connections uh, back in the day. Were people like just reaching out to each other by email? Uh, how how would he have even figured out how to find you? Like, did you have a presence at that time? Yeah. So the boss man, Ricky Hayes, owner of Debutify, he actually reached out to me back in 2017. I had one video on my YouTube channel, Mr. Da Vinci. It went viral, then got about 80,000 views. It was like um, winning products for, I want to say June 2019, 2020. And Ricky seen that video and he actually invited me to, uh, hop on a video with him. It was a YouTube video, but our timing and our schedule, it was conflicted. So we didn't get to do that. So then Ricky, he actually sent me an email and said, Hey, I like the type of content. Would you be interested in like making a tutorial showing your users and your audience how to set up um, their beautiful theme on your Shopify store? So I cranked out about two, two to five videos, a nice video series. And then Ricky reached out to me and said, Hey man, I really like the type of content that you're doing. I want to establish a partnership with you. So then we hopped on a call. It was for, got to be at least an hour. Ricky's a real nice guy, by the way. And um, from there, I just been with Debutify from the first theme um, to, I think, a year or two ago, you guys upgraded to 2.0 to recently, just a week ago, you guys been on the 3.0 Debutify. So, yeah, being here from the jump to seeing where you guys came so far is definitely a huge transition. I'm proud of what Ricky and the rest of the team have done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I I appreciate that. You know, I feel I feel like well, I mean, I've been with the company not quite a year, three quarters of a year. You know, it, it feels good to also have contributed in my, in my own uh, small way. Um, I want to get back to there's a couple of points that I wanted to raise uh, based on what you were describing about like uh, the internet psychology and the interest of how the internet has affected uh, human behavior. Now, I mean, I'm an, mm -hmm. I'm a '90s kid too. Uh, I was born in '89. Um, Okay, I mean, yeah, I could say I'm an 80s baby, but I'm not going to do that. That's absurd. You got to be like <laughs> 83, 84. Anyways. Yeah, like early 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what I found uh, with with my experience, and I want to hear your take on it too, is that I found that the internet, its main focus was to fill the gaps for whatever it is that the mortal world didn't exactly do for me. Um, had a lot of like niche and nerdy interests. Didn't really have anybody that can really talk to about it. On the internet, I could find people to talk to about it. Uh, and then I, I didn't really have like a good outlet for my creativity. Um, but then the internet gave me an outlet. Uh, I, I legally acquired a copy of Macromedia Flash and I legally <laughs> created cartoons on Newgrounds.com. And then again, it gave me a community to join. Uh, it gave me a voice, gave me a platform. It really like a lot of early level experiences for what is very similar mm -hmm. to what, what we do today. And to this day, I mean, 
it's I still feel that's true, but it. it it, it, it's because there are so many things that the internet can do that my 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 real life is actually like yeah, actually kind of limited without the internet at this point from for one i'm trapped in my apartment so there's that but like you know all my my earnings is all the internet um all the people that i talk to is now on the internet so whatever the situation is in life internet has always been what is there to then um make up for or uh, mm-hmm. just, I, I wish i could pick up like the perfect word and maybe um, my articulation is not on a uh, optimal today but anyways you get the point so um what was your takeaway after what you saw with the internet and the effect that it had on people i mean my biggest takeaway from the internet of how it affected people is it gave everyone a platform to connect with like-minded individuals who have a similar interest right so let me let me take this kind of off topic for a second so i'm a huge Go for it. anime advocate right so you know I, I watch a bunch of anime i've been watching anime since i was from the 90s right and um, Dragon Ball, Naruto, you name it, Yu Yu Hakusho, all all the good classics. Hold and, on, I'm gonna know, name one. Uh, Hunter x Hunter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah that's I, same I, I love that Yu Yu Hakusho. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, back then, back in the early '90s, late 2000s, the internet was there, right? It was just you know, I didn't know how to use that to connect with others. I just had to tell people in my friend, like my friends, people at school, things on that nature. But around the late 2000s or early 2010s, you know. I mean, forums and, you know, blog posts has always been there, but YouTube platform, it changed from like from early 2006, where it was just cat videos for the most part on YouTube or a bunch of entertaining videos to transition more into being an educational information platform. Now, don't get me wrong. YouTube is a search engine. It's definitely educational based. And, you know, people can be educated a lot more than they are doing now versus back 2006. But, you know, during that time frame, just YouTube was there for entertainment, laughs, giggles, maybe listen to music, so on, so on. And um, given where we are now, I feel like the Internet has opened a floodgate of opportunity. Like there's no there's no gatekeeper blocking you. So, right, if you want to transition from going from, let's say, someone who's working a job at a, as a cashier and they want to get into the midst of learning to how can I build a platform using social media? You know, there's a bunch of different things they can do. They can become Instagram influencer. They can become a YouTuber. They can become a TikToker, which is another platform, which I'm looking to, you know, dabble in myself. And it's just a floodgate of opportunities that I see is going to continue and developing for the long term. Many, many decades from now, you know, it's going to be something else. The internet will still be here. The internet won that game a long time ago. Yeah. That's basically what I'm trying to drive home. But it's just amazing, you know, how much the internet has changed. Um, you said you was born in 89, but I believe the internet really started taking off. I might be wrong. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 84, 86. But, you know, it really started transitioning. I'm going to use Jeff Bezos as a reference. He said around 1998, 1999, that's when he started Amazon. He was using like Google to run ads for all his products. That's back when he was selling books in the early days, you know, to where we are in 2021 now. So this is the watch that transition is nothing less a phenomenon. Yeah. And as I'm hearing this too, one of the things that I wanted to uh, come to a conclusion in my own mind is like how, uh, if it, if it humanizes or if it uh, dehumanizes and, well, you know, I, I think that uh, that does fall on each individual's person and our ability to um, uh, respect others and to um, uh, understand where reality starts and where reality stops, regardless if it's the Internet or if it's on TV or if it's print media or if it's even in conversation if somebody is being honest and upfront or if they're being uh, dishonest and disillusioned. So, like, the upside is that it, whereas where people only had as far as their tribe that they could mm-hmm. uh, they could interact with. Now the internet will bring the tribe in its entirety together, regardless of how big or how small the tribe is. A person can can find it, uh, and that's the beauty a thousand of it. Percent. Yeah, the yeah. the the. I don't know if it's a, if it's a downside, but there's always been a stigma. I feel where uh, a lot of what people do to be like a lot of behavior online, people say, "Well, yes, yeah, the internet, it doesn't matter." I'm like, uh, well, yeah, I still have some of the things that I've written when I was 10 years old on the internet and it's still around and I can't delete it. So yeah, actions actually Same. do have yeah. consequences uh, on it. So it, 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 it is interesting to see how, you know, a, a lot of our reputation lives and dies on what we do on the internet too. So, you know, behave yourself, you know, basically. I, I'll add on to that because, you know, given, given as, you know, the years keep going on, 
different actions and behavior affect different eras in that time zone, right? So when you was talking about when you was 10, when I was 10, we was definitely talking a whole bunch of different things we there wouldn't say now because, you know, we grow and we evolve, we adapt, our mindset grew, right? And back then, you know, it wasn't as PC, for better or worse terms, as it is now. You know, we could freely speak. I mean, you can still freely speak on the internet, right? On the, on the internet now, right? It is, you know, certain people will definitely react more to if you're saying something that's offending um, a person's ethnicity, gender, you know, things along that nature, which we don't got to discuss. But, you know, back then it wasn't so like being so under the microscope, right? It was just, they just go out there, whoever see it, they see it and so be it, right? And now it's more, everyone's like under the microscope and everyone's just watching. Now that that has pros and cons to it, right? Like you just elaborate. It's pros to it because there's more like-minded individuals who feel that way. They just add a different perspective on what you already put. Let, let's use Twitter, for example, right? I can put out a tweet. A lot of individuals, they'll retweet it, they'll respond, they like it, some will agree, some will disagree, right? But at the end of the day, you know, we still have that ability to voice our truest thoughts. And I believe strongly that the Internet, it reveals more of our true characters. I, this, this is something I was talking about with my friend the other day, funny enough. I was telling him, I said, do you feel more of yourself on the Internet or, you know, when you're on the Internet typing on social media? Or do you feel like more of yourself when you disconnect from the Internet? It's just you and, you know, your time. He's like, oh, I feel more of myself on the Internet. And, you know, that just goes back to our original point of how we can find other like, like it's like we have the ability now to reach those people and go to those people, especially if you're using like hashtags, so you can use a hashtag, you'll find hundreds, if not thousands of people who, you know, are interested in that topic versus, you know, back in the day, you just had to put whatever was out there and just hope that Google would give you enough search interest that other people would want to respond or leave a comment based on what you had to put out at that time. Yeah, well, I'd love to uh, give you one more point to support that as well with my own behavior online too. And, and mind you, you know, what I'm doing here, you know, this is the end of the day, this is a job. It's, there's, there's responsibilities. I'm, you know, I, 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 I have to adhere to uh, the guests and to the audience and all that. So, you know, there's certainly uh, limitations to some of the things that go on in my mind, right? I'm not, I can't get into too much conspiracy theory stuff here, but uh, I, I do put on my tinfoil hat once in a while. I'll say that. Same um, here. Yeah. <laughs> And, and what, what I say, what I say to your point about being more ourselves on the internet is that the internet is going to leave an impression. Um, everything that I do is not just this, uh, an interaction. Like if I'm just talking to my girlfriend, imagine if I'm talking to my girlfriend and it's being recorded and it has the ability to be disseminated across, uh, the, the entire landscape and lots of people can listen to it. So I, I, I'm, I'm conscious about like, okay, well, I'm going, I will be called out on my BS if I'm, if I'm dishonest or if, mm -hmm. uh, if I come across as fake. So I might as well just be myself and, you know, take, I would rather take those consequences, the honest ones rather than the dishonest consequences. Yeah. Authenticity is definitely the gateway to opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's well said. That one definitely wants to, I'm going to find its way that went onto a t-shirt. <laughs> All right, so I want to I want I I got I got to shift gears because here's something I really wanted to talk about. Um, so I check as the audience knows, I like to check out what our guest is up to, um, view the content, look for stuff that's uh, unique and distinct. And out of everybody I talk to, I have yet to uh, interview anybody who's doing cold calling. And I, I think most people know what cold calling is. I don't think we need to like do the the cold calling one on one. Um, yeah. So so we'll, I'll, I'm going to trust me. I'm going to trust my audience on that one. But what I found was fascinating is how cold calling is of is a classic, it's an old school sales method. And it's also one of the most difficult ones, hence the name cold calling, because you got to warm somebody up over, over a phone and not only sell them on it, but also, you know, earn their trust, uh, make, tell the, uh, convince that the, the potential client that it's legit. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I get phone calls and I'm like, uh, yes, sir. Can we, uh, can we fix your ducts? I'm like, if you, I'm in an apartment, like, so, you know, the, it, the, <laughs> the, a lot, uh, there's a, there's a lot of issues with it. Um, so I, I want to hear, you know, what, first of all, I, th I believe it's with your, your S at MMA. Um, it's with your agency that you, on behalf, you do the cold calling. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So the name of my agency of which I'm currently running now is called Millennial Media. I started this back in 2018. Yeah. So we're going on two years right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 what I would say to the, to the audience is, 
uh, go to the YouTube and actually like watch one of the videos where uh, Bernardo will just like will ter- have the phone call in its entirety. And so you can hear what are the objections, um, what are the questions that the client has and how you're addressing them and how you're just uh, e- explaining it. Um, so what I, what I find most fascinating and what I think is the most relevant question to ask in regards to this e-commerce uh, space that we're in is bridging the gap between the this old school method and what I assume are more like non-digital businesses like electricians, I believe is one of the uh, niches that you work in. So mm-hmm. how your your experience in reaching into what I can only describe as old school and and selling them on the contemporary medium that we have before us. Yeah. So the best way to answer that is I like to believe selling this is something that I learned when I was working at the car dealership recently. I learned that I'm not here to sell to people. I'm here to educate the people, right? So when I bid on a cold call, I'm completely interrupting whatever that business owner is doing, right? And at that time, they have one or two options. They can hear out what I have to say, or they can just get off the phone and go, hey, you're wasting my time. Click up. And you know, um, when I first started cold calling, that was something that was weighing on my mind heavy, right? Right. Um, what if I get rejected? What if he says no? But, you know, as I grown and I continue to build on that and build up my mental toughness, I had to realize that he wasn't trying to get me off the phone. I just wasn't providing enough value that it made sense for him to continue on the conversation with me. So I like to record myself in everything that I do. I'm a visionary learner. I like to see aspects where I did good, where I can improve, um, what I what I didn't like about what I did. I wouldn't call myself a perfectionist, but I do have that uh, self-awareness about myself that I can, you know, get that feedback, right? And um, the biggest thing, especially when I'm dealing with electricians, is their biggest concern is if I invest this money, how are you going to make this money back for me, right? Because they, they're they aware of the internet. They just don't know how to use the internet for their benefit. And um, to, make it as, to make a long story short, the best way of how I can explain that to them is the same way from a Shopify aspect is through using social media platforms, how you can, you know, get in front of these people. And then if you have the right ad copy, your video is entertaining, you have a good call to action, your website is up to par and in the lines with the potential customer avatar that you're looking to reach, this is be profitable for you for the long term versus you just depending on referrals or word of mouth from customers that you service and you know they just so happen to decide to tell someone else hey this guy did a great job maybe you should check him out versus you being on the internet overnight you know you go to sleep you wake up next morning you got like five ten different appointments filled out on your calendar ready for you to go to confirm that okay um so again that's just one thing that i want to get a little bit more clarity on so with your with your web presence there i understand i I believe one of the things i heard from the cold call is uh, the advantage of like a landing page uh, or, mm-hmm. or a sales funnel versus a, a typical atypical Shopify store uh, layout. Um, so I guess just the part of it that I want to get a little bit more clarity on is, so where exactly those that 10, those 10 potential clients are, are coming from in regards to traffic? Is that uh, based on the, the advertising that you're running or is it the SEO where they're searching it and they're just finding uh, your website organically? So what I like to offer all my clients when I work with them is I prefer them to have a sales funnel. And the only reason why I prefer a sales funnel versus a traditional Shopify website is a sales funnel, at least the one that I create for my clients, is three steps. I'm going to run it down real fast for everybody listening. So the first uh, part of the funnel is the opt-in page. Now, on the opt-in page, we're looking to gather the customer information if they're interested. And, you know, from an advertising aspect, Uh, My bread and butter is Facebook and Instagram, but when I work with my clients, I kind of step out of my element and transition into also adding Google as well as YouTube ads, right? So we get all these platforms. Let's start top of the funnel. So we send the advertising here, right? Now they come into the funnel. They went from a cold audience to like a warm audience, right? So now we land on the first page of the funnel, which is the opt-in page, where here we'll get the clients or potential prospects name. We're looking to get their email. We look to get their phone number, right? And then they hit the enter button, which takes them to the second page. So now they're still in that warm phase, but now they have questionnaires about, you know, what am I expecting, what I'm about to see. Now on the second page, what I like to tell my clients is, I like for all my clients to shoot an eight to 10 minute video, just explaining what they do, what services they had, the results, how long they've been doing it. You know, things that educate the customer to establish the no like and trust foundation, right? And then from there, we'll have a, 
call to action for where the customer, I prefer that my client set it up where the customer can pay right there on the second page. Because at that point, you pretty much told them adjust to what you do and adjust of how you can help them, right? And then, you know, if the prospect decides to pay, they'll pay, which takes them lastly to the third page of the funnel, which is the thank you page. And that's where we'll have the client shoot like another five minute video talking about go ahead. Thank you for your vote of confidence and believing in what we have to offer. Click the link below so you can schedule a time for both of us to meet up. And then from there, you know, the client's able to call the prospect, set that up, make sure that um, everything's aligned with both of them. And then they go out and fulfill the job. Versus, you know, being on a Shopify website where, you know, it's like five different sectors at the top. Then you got the about me, then you got the review. It's just a bunch of distracting factors versus on the sales funnel. You only got one or two options. You can opt in or you can just leave. But, you know, being a Shopify dropship and everyone who's watching this or listening to this podcast, you know, we know about retargeting. So if someone leaves, you know, we can retarget them until, you know, they get tired of seeing us or, you know, the time on our pixel expires for them and then we'll no longer target them. And that's, a lot of upsides in which I like to explain to my clients just so they can get the best bing for their buck. Yeah, and just using electricians as an example, I think that, I mean, for one, they're, in one sense, they're only offering one service, which is they're going to Correct. help provide somebody electricity. But within that one service, there is a multitude of uh, concerns and matters that they have to resolve for each individual client. How many plugs do they got to uh, uh, install? How are they going to take over previous work for somebody else? Is this a fresh job? Are they going to be working with contractors? So there's a like hundred different things that they might need to discuss with the customer. So they might as well not inundate the customer with a hundred different options and overwhelm them or worse, made the customer think that they're going to, if the customer ends up like signing up for a service, that's not even the right one because they think, oh, that's the one. Oh, okay. So that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I guess one thing that I wonder too is, um, are you, is your strategy um, lean heavily more towards uh, non-digital clients so you can help onboard them digitally? Or is that more like a coincidence? So like, where do you typically strategize? Um, It varies. Right. Because when I first started my cold calling, when I first started my social media marketing agency, I was just taking on anyone that I could get. Right. Like whether they had a presence online, whether they didn't want to go online, I was just take anywhere, anyone who'd be interested in what I had to offer them. Um, given where I'm at right now, I more so prefer to work with clients or prospects who already has a presence online just because they're already attached to the idea that they believe in social media, they believe in the impact that it had, they believe in all of the fruits of the labor that can um, exponentially have their business taken to the next level, depending you know where they are now versus where they want to be, right? Um, but I also will say that I'm not against working with people who's not online. It's just more of a slower process because all this is new to them. They're aware of what it does. It's just that they're not fully... They're not fully invested into the idea. They're more so, okay, you have to show me this, which I show all my clients, show all the clients, my results from my Facebook ads, Instagram ads, you know, so on, so on. But they more so want to see it. And then once it starts happening to them, that's when they start becoming a believer and go, okay, I believe that this works. And they slowly transition from, you know, the traditional brick and mortar business where they, you know, the retail and then they come into the store and buy versus you using the internet to get people to come to your store and buy Okay, uh, so the next thing I want to ask then, uh, and this is, by the way, this is coming from my own um, uh, sales background too. I was mainly in watches and uh, now I guess luckily for me is uh, it was all inbound calls because people want watches. So I just got to like uh, answer the question. So, so they come in with their objections uh, and what they mm -hmm. want is for somebody to validate those objections. Whereas I, 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 you're entering into their territory. So they don't just use objections as a way to um, create trust in their own mind, they're using objections as a barricade in a, almost in a way where like they want to almost like, you know, uh, get you, get you to uh, test you, get you to, to dis disengage to, for their own sake, maybe they're being protective. They don't just want to say yes to everything. They, they're not convinced. So, um, I, so I want to ask you about, you know, what are some of the objections that you normally face and how you overcome them? And I would like to hear if there's differences between the more non-digital or non-contemporary businesses like electricians versus the um, uh, contemporary ones. Bearing in mind, you did say one of them, which is that they're not really aware how it works. So I will keep that in mind. Uh, that is, I yeah. guess, one objection. But uh, along that same lines, I'd like to hear what else uh, you've had to overcome. 
Sure. So typically when I make cold calls, I get faced with a bunch of objections, right? Um, the main one that I typically get as soon as I start a call is I'm not interested. And I go, okay. So if someone was to tell me they're not interested, my belief, and this might sound like, um, I don't want to sound like an oil oil salesman, right? Snake but oil? I believe, yeah, snake oil salesman. But I believe that as long as we're on the phone and as long as you throw me objections, I'm going to throw you rebuttals, right? And unless you hang up on the phone, I'm going to keep going. I might throw like three, four rebuttals. And if nothing happens, I go, OK, this, that's enough. I don't, don't want to piss nobody off. I want to you know, leave on good terms. But the first one that I typically get is they're not interested. And I go, OK, if you're not interested, what are you doing now to get customers to, you know, for your services? Right. And then from there, that's a transition. Right. Because they already hit me with an objection. I had them with a rebuttal. So now they can hang up the phone or we can continue the conversation. So from there, it just become a battle of mental toughness. They want to see, are you truly an expert who can take me from where I'm at to where I want to go? Or are you just on the phone, you just making cold calls because your company's paying and that's what you want to do, right? So then once we figure out, you know, what they're doing to get clients, I like to ask them, how many people do you have working with them? Some people, they close off. They don't want to tell me that information. Some people, they just, it's just me, right? So right there, not only am I gathering intel, but I'm taking notes of this. So when we do hop on a meeting, I have this information jotted down. So when we follow up, I can remember where we stand and what they got currently going on. Um, another objection of which I get faced with is they go, so a lot of people like to ask me just straight out the gate, how much is this going to cost me, right? Because they just want to get straight to the point. How much is this? How much is that? And I like to tell all of my prospects, I can't give you a set price. And the reason why I can't give you a set price is because I like to personalize each pack, each package based on each individual prospect need, right? Because not everyone has the same needs, not everyone has the same want, right? You might be already having five, 10 jobs and you're content with that, right? So you may or may not need what I had to offer you. But what I can tell you is on top of the five, 10 jobs that you have, I could potentially get you more high, higher paying jobs, which would amount in more money in your bank account, giving you more time and your freedom. And if you so choose, you will have less jobs where you have to work because the jobs that I'm bringing to you are paying you double, sometimes triple what you're getting currently, which will you know benefit you for the long term, right? So, I mean, the objections that they throw, it's more so, it's more so questionnaire based. And I say, I wouldn't say it comes from a mind of scarcity or pes pessimistic, pessimism, pessimism, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's more so of, you know, you're interrupting me, right? Like you're, you're interrupting my day. And on a cold call, you got one minute. Actually, I'll take that back. You got like 10 seconds to make a good impression. Um, as Jordan Belfort said, you got to be sharp as attack. You got to be confident. You got to be seen as an expert. And, you know, you have to transition that information through the phone. It's not like me and you where we can like look at each other and go back and forth on the podcast, right? It's more so I got one shot, one opportunity to convince, not really convince, but to educate this person on how I can help them if they're interested in taking my help. And um, as far as people who are already online, right? Like the clients I work with, because I work with restaurants as well. And those have been my type of, some of my favorite clients to work with because they already got the content made. They're already aware of how the advertising go. They already know that they have to spend money and make money right. And then, you know, if I was to work with, um, let's say like a mobile mechanic, because I got a few of those clients, right? They don't want to be on the internet. All they want me to do is just getting them phone calls, right? So they go, as long as you can give me phone calls, I'll close the deals. That's all I'm concerned about. If you can give me phone calls, I'll close the deals. And, you know, that's our relationship. So it just, it, it depends. It varies on the niche. It varies on the small business owner, big business owner, entrepreneur. It just varies on the situation. And then I just try to add value and educate them as best as I possibly can. So that yeah. makes sense for them. That's a great answer to the question. It reminded me of a, a, a photographer uh, client that I had uh, when I was doing more of my freelancing. Um, the term that she used is along the same lines. It's a trusted advisor where they, they're they just a source of information and expertise. And so uh, while they might all not always uh, close a sale, they're always the person that they turn to, to for, for trust and to have a, a deeper understanding of it. Because not everybody has the time to learn all of the services and skills that they need to uh, to have a functioning and thriving business. Correct. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's another point too that I wanted to um, 
Um, make just about phone calls in specific. So again, me, um, I, I, I feel my, I, I consider myself very fortunate that all my sales was all inbound. So I, I, I don't know. I, there are times where I just say, Hey, why don't I just like cold call a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these law firms, see if I can sell them some watches. And the boss is like, no, don't do it. All right. All right. All right. Fine. fine. I'm just saying <laughs> some of these, some of these lawyers I've seen what they're wearing. Ugh. Anyways, uh, I think when somebody answers the phone, there is at least some element of openness to it, especially because a, a lot of times people will see an unidentified number or the phone will say a potential spam or potential fraud alert. So a lot of times I, I, I just look at my phone number now and it's like, all right, you know what? Not even worth it. It's telling me to block. I trust it. So when I answer the phone, I am making a tacit admission that I am somewhat open to whatever it is being offered on the other side. Now, again, if somebody wants to clean my ducts out, I say, well, I, I don't have ducts for you to clean, so go away. But yeah. I, 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 I think there is some psychology there to the ability to answer the phone for somebody. It used to be like when I was younger and I was like in my teens and I didn't recognize the phone number. I was just hoping it'd be a girl I liked because I oh well, maybe this is uh, somebody willing to admit their feelings for me. That ne never happened because that, that would be insane. Um, but uh, these days, if I answer the phone, I'm like, OK, well, I'll, I'll hear him out. Could be could be something. Um, but yeah, you know, um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Oh, um, yeah, I remember what I was going to say. Um, yeah. So when they was, um, calling me about the car and whatnot, you know, I know that that's what the job doing versus, you know, being on the opposite side of that, when I'm calling the prospect, you know, I know that I can, what I can offer for them is valuable because, you know, I work with other clients, right. And I only go for niches where I already got clients in because I can show them testimonials and results from my previous clients versus if I was going to a niche where I don't have any clients, then, you know, I got to show and prove 10x that, right? Because I don't have no social proof that I can give to them. And, you know, that just, um, and from there, it just becomes a game of tug of war, you know, back and forth, going back and forth. But um, yeah, getting back to the original point of, you know, calls and just accepting calls in general, I just feel more people are more conscious of who they allow into their life like and who they allow into their universe versus just openly answering any phone call yeah 100 percent. i mean it's just um the 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 very uh, the fact that like back way 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 back back when most people had like rotor phones if the phone was ringing our expectations culturally were like, okay, well, you know, it's either the milkman or it's Betty from next door, or just like there, there's, there's not as many um, options for who is going to be calling. So our, we're conditioned to expect uh, certain things to uh, certain people to be on the other side of it. So I uh, can, th th these days though, people are conditioned to not even like pick up the phone sometimes just uh, anyways. Uh, I don't want to keep getting too far down into that point because I've already made it twice. So what are the, I don't think this is reminding me of. So here in, in Toronto, we have this thing called the CNE Canadian National Exhibition and a bunch of vendors all over. They, they, they sell their products. And, and I remember this one um, sa uh, sales group, they were trying to sell uh, soles to go inside the shoe. And, and I, and I, and I kept, and I, and I noticed that they had their, their, their script and they had their routine and they were just, and they, and they knew my objections and they had dealt with this. They were dealing with this all day. You're going to be dealing with this constantly for, for two weeks straight, just trying to get as many sales as they can. And mm -hmm. there was a small part of me that was getting kind of, um, yeah, I was getting annoyed because I, I guess as a fellow salesperson, I was hoping that we were all part of this exclusive club where salespeople wouldn't sell to one another. Like, like, okay, you don't need to be on. I'm, I, I do this job too. You can, you can relax and just, you know, uh, shoot the breeze with me, but they just couldn't do it. Like they couldn't like yeah. uh, disconnect. So I'm just wondering, like, have you, um, have you encountered a, a situation like that? Or like, have you found, first of all, fair question to you. Do you have like an on state versus an off state or me? I'm more like, I'm, I'm basically, I'm always Joseph. Like, I don't know, like thing, they, the denials, they change a little bit here or there, but I don't know. I don't really have like a, Whoa. Okay. That was, you, <laughs> yeah. you know where I'm going with that. But yeah. So just tell me about like, um, I, I guess how, how it's affected like your relationship with other people in sales and just like your own ability to who you convey versus, um, the, the salesperson that you convey. Yeah. So let me tell you a quick story. So recently before I hopped on this podcast, like last month, I was working at a um, car dealership, right? You know, I was selling cars and I went there because I wanted to be a better salesman and selling higher ticket items. So 
you know, upon my time being there, I was like, you know, we're all, we, we got that on switch, right? Like we, we want to sell cars and that was the goal, sell more cars. But I was like, you know, when we had downtime, like, are you guys going to be your authentic self or are you just going to be in full sales and mode? So I was like kind of testing the waters with them. And, you know, upon reflecting on that, I feel that I'm 80% always on, right? Like um, I, I want to be top notch. I want to be high performance. I always want to be in that mental state, right? But then when I get around, let's say like friends, family, girlfriends, et cetera, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm still me. I'm still Bernard at the end of the day. I'm always going to be me whether people, you know, like, love it, hate it. I'm always going to be me because I always want to be true to myself. But at the same time, you know, I can't be in sales mode where I'm like everything serious, everything got to be top notch, everything got to be like boom, 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 because I know that, you know, the people who know me most, they know they know that that's what I do, but that's not how they come to know me. So it just depends for me personally on based on the environment I'm in, the people I'm around and what my, intentions are at that current given time yeah i i I hear you on that i think that's a that's a great take on it uh okay and 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 in the interest of that so we we mentioned earlier that you know you're um uh you're a musician um do you go by do you just uh, characterize yourself as rap artist is that fair i didn't hear all your music so i don't know if like if it's it's all right so so i make i make rap music i make pop music to a lesser degree i make country music um, I like to consider myself, uh, um, I like to consider myself an artist more than a rapper, right? Yeah. Because, and different types of my song, I got chill songs where it makes you think. I got hype songs in case you want to get hype. I, I sing somewhat sometimes. Thank you. Thank you, Autotune. I hear whoever made Autotune to help me out phenomenally. Um, and then, like I said, country. At one point, I was making rock music. We had a, this cool ass rock band. Um, but you know, we all grew up and everyone went their separate ways. Right. But I consider myself more of an artist just because, um, the way of my creation process is different, you know, versus me just sticking to strictly rap. Right. Because if I'm just strictly rapping, it's more so I'm just making like anthems to make you hype, make you dance, make you want to move. Just especially if your car, just turn the volume all the way out and just ride. Right. Versus being an artist, I can tell a story. And I can, you know, t- give people more insight about me, what's going on in my life, certain topics, you know, just different things I can talk about. But I like consider myself more of an artist. Yeah, f- uh, uh, fair enough. I, I I appreciate that. I wasn't expecting you to say country, but I'm glad I asked the question just because it's yeah. like, you know, I, I don't want to um, immediately characterize you as like primarily or exclusively a rap artist. Or, so I appreciate that. And so the, the original question uh, and the reason why I brought this up was because of you know, if people's perception of you has actually affected your your, your performance or, or job prospects or anything along those lines. And I, and I will say too, just so the audience understands is I had this issue too. Um, it, 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 it didn't come to pass all that badly, uh, but, I did, but I did get tattooed. Actually, so this is video now, so I don't know if I showed the tattoo to my audience yet, but there it is. And, you know, when I first got it, a lot of people were like, oh, that's really cool. But aren't you worried you're not going to get jobs with it now? And, and I wasn't, worried when I got it, but I was worried after I got it. And then all of a sudden I thought, oh no, you know, what if that actually like really affects uh, people's opinions of me? Um, it did right. make things difficult at one job that I had because I was an apprentice for this really angry Hungarian watchmaker. Um, but the good news is I was so incompetent at that job that he was going to yell at me for like a dozen other reasons anyway. So, you know, <laughs> the t- when the tattoo yeah. was just like the, the, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, there was other straws. Uh, ready for it but yeah uh it has uh have you encountered anything along these lines yeah so upon touching what you're saying i got a bunch of tattoos right here um this is just on one hand and i got um other tattoos on this hand i don't know if they'll be able to see this when this goes live right but i was always i mean i i've always felt that i was an entrepreneur at birth rapping was just an additional skill set that you know i could add to my repertoire and that affected me more so in anything and the workplace, right? More than, you know, what I'm able to do, what I do now. And the only reason it affected me in the workplace, I don't know if the stigma is still active, hopefully it's not, but people feel that people who's tattooed can't be employed. And I feel that's a very biased opinion, right? Because my tattoo, how I want to paint this picture of myself, you know, on my physical body shouldn't affect my performance of when I'm in that job, right? Because as long as I get the job done, as long as I complete the task that's given to me, 
that should be, I mean, there's other factors that matter, but that should be the main factor because that's why you hired me. You wanted me to solve a solution. And if you're just looking at me and you're looking at my tattoos and you're already trying to brush me off, one, you know, I don't want to work with people like that. I mean, maybe we could talk it out, see why they have this opinion, what what affected them at one point in their life. But it's just like you're you're judging it based off an appearance, right? And that's the thing, like being a musician and, you know, also being an entrepreneur when I got to meet these clients, right? Because when I go see them, you know, I dress up, I might wear a nice suit, might nice button up, right? And then, you know, when, when you go to shake someone's hand, like you, I also have a tattoo on my hand. So they look at that and they go, I don't know. I go, before you, you know, start to judge me, you know, let me hear out what I have to say and let me hear out what you have to say. And then we can put that behind us. Then at the end of the conversation, we can bring things full circle. You know, if that's a problem, so be it. I respect that. And we can go our separate ways. Right. But that was just, um, I don't know. That's just a stigma that I feel that should have been exfoliated a long time ago. But that's just some of my personal experience um, with having tattoos, and being an entrepreneur and a rapper. Yeah. And if I could just say, too, just in, in having this conversation with you, the, the thing that really the only thing that really is important is, is your face. And it got yeah. to a point where I was just focused on the face and I w- wasn't paying attention to the to the hair, wasn't paying attention to the background, nothing. Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, hair is obviously it's a, it's a part of the head, but I don't know. I guess I, I just at a certain point, I just started like just seeing, you know, just seeing you as you are, uh, which is something that, you know, I'd like to encourage everybody to do because that's that's the important part. Yeah, you should definitely always express yourself, you know, um, what I believe in is self-love is the most important love you could ever get. And I like to believe that I'd rather be at peace with myself than be at war with the world than be mm-hmm. to at peace with the world and war with myself, right? Because that's a battle that I always had to fight for the rest of my years versus, you know, I can go to a different part of the world and they can treat me entirely different versus, you know, just one limited air. Um, but yeah, that's just something that I believe internally. Mm-hmm. And and since we we don't talk about tattoos too often on this show here on Ecomonics is you know things get a little quirky from time to time but like you know we've uh, uh, it's I I think it's uh, it makes for more interesting content uh, on an episode as a basis you never know what you're gonna get but one thing that I like to say on tattoos just for people who don't have them and they wonder why people want them the thing I, I I tell people if they want to get a tattoo is that you have to imagine you already have it a tattoo is something so integral to who I am that I'm not paying an artist to to draw it on me. I'm paying an artist to reveal it at long last. So in order to have something that connected to to a person uh, to the point where it's permanent, that's the mindset that I encourage people that I have that they're going to get one themselves. Yeah, and I add on to that point, I believe that when you get a tattoo, it unlocks another characteristic of you, right? So imagine this. You're the protagonist of your life. For those who play video games, right? You know, you're the protagonist, you're the main character, right? And every time you level up, let's say Final Fantasy, for example, right? Cloud. Cloud levels up, you get a new sword, he gets a new magic attribute, right? Same thing applies for with a tattoo. When you get a tattoo, it like levels you up, not just, you know, from a physical look where it makes you look better, but it also builds a different story or so or you know, whatever you decide to tattoo on your body, you can tell people what that means to you, what that represents and how that, you know, that affects you and why you chose to get it. Um, especially those who are first timers getting tattoos. Um, I definitely believe that they should go for something that they're comfortable li- living with for the rest of their life. Right. Because as you added, this is permanent. Now, given you can get it removed, uh, might hurt a little, you know, laser surgery, whatnot, but you can get it removed. But for the most part, you know, these tattoos are permanent. And the way I like to look at it is if I'm going to have it for life, I at least want it to be meaningful. That That's mm-hmm. the biggest takeaway I want someone to take from this. If this is your first time getting a ta- tattoo, make sure that it's meaningful and you're comfortable, you know, living with that for the rest of your life. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that came to my mind, too, because you mentioned um, uh, a cloud. And one of the things about game design is that the game has to be developed in such a way that the designer knows what it's going to take for the player to beat it. The player has to be of a certain level, have a certain gear, uh, have certain uh, skills, have their party layout uh, effective so that they can beat the end boss because otherwise they don't win the game and then they're stuck in limbo forever and then uh, Sephiroth right. goes on a killing spree. And we don't want that. So in that same in that same vein, you know, in order for us to uh, to achieve our goals in life, 
it, what we're doing is we're we're acquiring all of the pieces that have been laid out for us. And so a lot of that is in self-trust and in, in, in some way in believing that the path is laid out for us um, in such a way that we know we're going to take it. And by the time we get to the end, we have realized our full self. Yeah. So I like the, this is quoting the late great Nipsey Hussle, rest in peace. It's about the marathon, you know, not the destination. Or in a better use of words, it's about the journey, not the destination, right? So the journey will always continue. Each day, each second, each minute that passes, we're adding more onto our journey, which, you know, for the most part is in our own best self-interest so that as we continue to gather the resources, the information, everything that we feel is applicable for us to progress and transition to our highest self, we add that to our um, experience so that we're able to let, let me say it like this. Every decade, you become another version of yourself, you know, from 10, 20. I'll, I'll be 30 in September, so I'll go ahead and claim 30. And, you know, I I always I like to take what I could from when I was younger and keep that in my belt. But I'm also at the same time ready to release what no longer serves me moving forward. And that's how I like to look at life. Like I, I take all the experiences, whether it's good or bad, so that I can build off that. And, you know, as I continue to develop, well, my next 10 years, I'll be 40, right? So I'll take everything that I can learn in my 20s and 30s. And then, you know, when I'm 40, I'll be I'll be prepared. Not fully prepared because life's an ongoing journey, like I was saying, right? But I'll be more, I'll be more anticipating what's next to come in my life, right? Like we always gotta stay open to possibility. Even going back to when I was talking about men co calls, a lot of people like tell me no. And something I like tell my sales team. No just means next opportunity, right? So just don't ever give up and just keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there was a um, Greg Halpern from a previous episode. They gave me the uh, access to some of the Formula 4 protocol. And one of the things that he had uh, he had said is the diff- there, if you try to eliminate no as much as possible, obviously you don't mm-hmm. want to like, you know, if somebody asks you to jump off a bridge or put your hand over open flame, okay, you say no. But it's really about yes and then not now. Because when you say not now, you acknowledge it, but then you understand that my time just isn't at the right moment in order to do this. And what's funny, of course, is that like, you know, she, um, I, 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 took, I listened to that. I took that point in and then immediately my girlfriend is like, uh, hey, do you, um, uh, do, do you remember what we had for dinner yesterday? I'm like, No. No, oh, oh, I, tr- I tried. I tried. Something, something along those lines, like not exa- not not that exact question, but it was just funny to me. He's like right afterwards, I'm like, no, I don't remember that. Um, so we're 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 closing in on 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 about an hour here. Um, so uh, and again to our audience, or, as always, you you go onto the YouTube, you check the content out. There's uh, hours of a uh, great insight. Um, there was one insight from uh, earlier on in your YouTube profile that I wanted to uh, to to close on because I think it'd be a good, interesting topic just to leave with the audience to think about, which was um you know overcoming addiction. Now, sure. we've, we've talked about addiction uh, in the past, and uh, you know there's some as you say there's small ones, there's big ones. But what I found was interesting is that there are addictions within e-commerce that are like specific to e-commerce, or like people are addicted to say like maybe if like they're constantly looking for new apps to install that maybe they're not actually practical to install. So like what are from today till back then, you know, what was your, um, how did you come to realize that like there are addictions within e-commerce? What do they look like? You know, we, we know what, uh, we know cigarettes, we know coffee, we know sugar, we know some stuff. I'm not going to say out loud, but like in e-commerce, what's addictive there? Yeah. So, what I believe is addictive in e-commerce is information overload, right? So I know a lot of people listening to this, they're probably on YouTube, they're probably watching a bunch of Shopify YouTubers, right? And they're trying to gather intel as well as gather intel from this Dave Beautify podcast, right? And, you know, they'll take that and they'll get what's known as a sugar high or like a dopamine rush, right? So then immediately they hear that and they go, okay, I heard that, I'm ready to go, I'm fired up, right? And then, you know, as soon as they start applying what they hear, what they learn, they may see similar results. They may see the same results or they may see no results. And if you feel that you hit no results, you just you're like in um, the gray area. Right. You're just like, okay, I'm here. How do I get out of here? So then this is where the addiction comes into play. And this is something I'm speaking from personal experience. I believe at one point if I had. 30, 50 plus apps running on my shop store, that is what it would take for me to make sales. 
which clearly wasn't the case. Now on all my Shopify stores, I might have 10, 15 apps at most, right? But, you know, back then I thought apps is what drives the sale. Apps is what's going to make my customers want to buy. And, you know, that can become addicting because you think it's the apps doing the work when really it's more so about, I mean, there's a bunch of different factors that factor in to make a customer's journey so that they want to buy. But the more so what we can control is like the ad copy, a good offer, um, the benefits of the product, the website speed, you know, the shipping times, things along that, which we can control, right? And then to a lesser degree, another addicting factor is getting that first sale, right? Because when you get that first sale, it's like uh, 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 an explosion of happiness, an explosion of, I did it. I, I feel like this work. I'm on top of the mountain. I did it. The, the world is mine now, right? And then, you know, you try and do that again. It may work, but if it doesn't work, you're like, oh, why didn't it work? And now you just, you just, you stuck in that mindset of thinking of all the things of what could go wrong, what needs to be fixed. And then you start adjusting the whole theme. Like, for example, the debutify thing, you might go in there, you might start adding all the, uh, the uh, add ons to it. You might start trying to change your main front on the home page, like, right. And then, in all truth, you don't need to, you know, increase that. You could just, for a lesser degree, let's say we're on Facebook, we could work on improving our click through rate, we can work on improving our video content, right? And, you know, I feel that that can become addicting, which is, I mean, a, there's good addictions and there's bad addictions, but I'm gonna stick for the good just for this topic, right? And you know, I feel that that can lead people to make impulse decisions, which isn't always in their best interest. I feel that we should be able to approach any situation with 50% logical and 50% emotional base, but before we come to a full circle conclusion. That's terrific. Also, I think it's you made a good observation too that there can be good things that the things that people are addicted on in a good way. Exercise can be addictive. If that's a good thing. Um, you know, get, getting up at a, at a good time can be addictive. So yeah, there's, you know, we, it's it's part of our psychology. You know, we do in, uh, in some cases we do need to have our, our addictions, but I, I think it's 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 just the 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 stigma the stigma attached to it. And whenever we say it, it's usually like the negative ones and not so much the positive ones. But nonetheless, I think you make a really good point. And and I notice I've run into that issue too. Full disclosure. Um, cause again, I had the luxury of being able to talk to a lot of inspirational people and, and take, and take away, um, uh, valuable lessons. And yeah, I get that hit too. I'm like, man, that felt really good. Yeah. I'm motivated to go. And like slowly over time, things do change. You know, I, I, like I have a store now. I change the name. I got to change the name of it because I don't like the name of it anymore. But that's beside the point. So I, I, I totally re- um, uh, respect that. Like it, 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 it happens. And one thing I was working on even today, like I was like scanning YouTube while I was uh, uh, eating my 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 delayed breakfast, is uh, I thought, you know what? I spend a lot of time just watching like junk and schlock, like like v- reviews of like last week's episode of um of a Marvel movie or uh, of a Marvel show, and like. Okay, what if I just like look for something educational and ended up on Charisma on Command and just talked about how like how um, Hugh Jackman, uh, uh, Hugh Jack, Hugh Grant, one of the one of the Hughes, the Australian guy, I think the guy who played uh, Wolverine, and just like mm-hmm. things that he does to uh, make other people comfortable, and I'm like, that was a much better takeaway than the schlock, and so that 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 is like one thing I did just today to identify an addiction and find a way to turn that addiction of wanting to watch content into a way that's more positive. Yeah. And that just comes down to self-awareness, right? Like you just mentioned, you realize that it would be more beneficial for you to watch um, Charisma on Command, um, given his take on Hugh Jackman versus you just watching um, what just came out recently, like the Snyder Cut, yeah. you know, the Justice League. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, there's a time and place for that, right? Yeah. Because let, let's just stick with the Justice League. That movie is four hours and two minutes long, right? Now that that to me, that's a that's a block period, right? Because there's so much you can get done in that four hour time frame. But if you do that in moderation, it becomes it becomes um, a habit, right? Because it takes about 21 days to build a habit. It takes 90 days for the habit to last. So if you could do that in moderation, not saying that anyone will watch that movie every day for 21 days, just want to be full disclosure, but you know, if you can find the balance in between entertainment and education, you can then create this self-identity for yourself where you're able to work, 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 work 
smart, of course. And then, you know, you lay back, relax, and go, okay, I did my work for today. Now I can kick back and enjoy myself in the other aspect, just so you don't, you know, have your mind. I don't want to say information overload or you have um, the shiny object syndrome, right? But at the same time, it gives you the freedom to declutter your mind. And then you can go within yourself to figure, is this helping me or is this hurting me? And if it's hurting me, you know, I got to let that go. It's not as easy as just saying, I'm going to let it go. And it's not like that. It takes time. You, gotta, you know, you got acknowledgement and there's four or five other steps to go along with that, right? But just the fact that you acknowledge it, you have that split second to where you can change that and go, okay, if this is doing that to me, then let me find something else that can put me where I want to be, you know, moving forward in the next week, next month or so. And then, you know, add more time to that, right? Because that's something I'm trying to do for myself. I'm trying to learn how to trade Forex, right? But at the same time, you know, aside while I'm not doing my agency or my shop fly store or making music, I'm playing Call of Duty. And I might play Call of Duty for one hour, sometimes three hours, sometimes I just lose track of Call of Duty. I go, okay. And I, I catch myself after a few games, go, whoa, 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 I, I got to take a break. And then I transition going back to Forex, right? So it just comes down to self-awareness. Self-awareness is key. Uh, well said, and I, I think with that we're, uh, we're we're good to wrap up here, uh, Ronaldo. It's been it's been fantastic meeting you and talking to you. This has been a, a great conversation. So I, I really appreciate having you here. And at long last, you you finally get a chance to um, to really to it's to just uh, have a conversation with the the beautified company. And it's it's great to have you as a as a as been like really like a long time uh, partner, I guess, or affiliate or whatever is the right word for it. Yeah. Um... Like I said in the beginning, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy that I, me and you were able to take out this time, both our schedules, to have this conversation. I feel it's very beneficial for everyone listening, as well as, you know, when we throw it on our platforms for our audience to gather intel. Um, I'm just happy that we was, you know, able to link up and make this happen, given, you know, me being such a longtime partner with Beautify for uh, going on three years now, you know, just seeing the course of everything, how everything's changed and developed for the greatest good, you know. I want to see you guys keep going. I want to see you guys keep winning. And as you guys continue to improve, so will I. So here's wishing to both of us continue growing and flourishing. Terrific. And doors always open, by the way. So, you know, you want to, you want to come back on give it a quarter or two, let us know how things are going. Be happy to have another conversation. Oh yeah. I definitely want to come back, give you guys an update for my journey. And if anyone listening to this, you know, you got any comments, definitely leave it below. Um, you, you, I'm sure that next time we talk in like a quarter or two, you can update me with the thoughts, how people felt about this feedback, so on, so on. And yeah, I'd be happy to come back I'm and sorry. talk to you anytime. Excellent. So with that, the the last question, well, actually, the last question is usually like in two parts. One of them is if you have any like last bits of wisdom or parting advice, anything you want to share, you're welcome to. It's just that we, it's been jam-packed with wisdom. So, you know, if there's anything else you can share, feel free. If not, don't worry about it. But so yeah. we'll take care of that. I, and then... I, I, yeah, go ahead. Good. Yeah. Um, so my last bit of advice for everyone listening is to double down on your strengths, right? Actually triple down on your strengths. I want everyone, I'm assuming everyone's listening to this is somewhere between the ages of 16, maybe through 50, maybe 65 plus, somewhere, whatever age range you fall to, I want you to try a bunch of different things, especially from a Shopify aspect. I want you to be comfortable with losing money as well. I know that's not much advice that you hear, but you have to get the data from the platforms to figure out who is best suited for the products of which you're trying to advertise through these platforms, right? Because the platforms is just an extension of adding to our customer base for the long term for us to build a brand, which I'm assuming everyone that's Shopify store is, you know, their long term goal to build a brand, have an existing customer base, so on, so on. So I want everyone here just to give their all. Um, some days, you may or may not feel like doing this and that's okay. But, you know, as long as you don't give up, you persevere, you continue to invest, you continue to educate yourself and you give your all every day, all day, you can never lose. Fantastic. You can never lose. All right. And then uh, let the audience know how they can find you. Sure. So if anyone's interested in finding me, you can check me out on YouTube. Just type in Mr. Da Vinci. If you're interested in hearing more of my music, you can check me out on YouTube, um, Bernardo Da Vinci. Follow me on Instagram. It's Bernardo Da Vinci. Um, 
You can look me up on Facebook too. You have to type in Mr. Da Vinci or Bernardo Da Vinci. I'm not sure which one pops up, but your best bet to get in contact with me would be through Instagram. Like I said, at Bernardo Da Vinci or on my YouTube channel, Mr. Da Vinci, where I have tons of free content showing you my Shopify dropshipping journey. Actually from the beginning when I first started in 2017, 2018, up to 2021, as well as showing you know my Facebook ads, um, tips and techniques tutorials that I have on there too. So in any of those platforms, I'd be happy to talk to each and every one of you and give as much advice that I can for you. Excellent. Um, and, and thanks for everything that you uh, brought with, to the table today. Uh, I can't thank you enough. And to our audience, as I also can't uh, thank all of you enough for participating in this. It means a lot to be able to provide this information to you. So, uh, And also, by the way, one thing that we, we learned is uh, we were looking at our analytics and we're happy to see our downloads, but we were also happy to see that people listen the whole way through. That means a lot. It really does know that like the people who are checking this this content out, they, they stick to, to the very end. So thank you for putting up with my occasional uh, quirkiness. And by occasional, I mean like I'm constantly fighting it. It's like a dam that bursts. Anyways, uh, with that, take care, all the best, and we'll check in soon. Uh, I'm a head of marketing at a company, print, print and demand company called Printful. So I... Hey, this is Joseph from Ecomonics. Just wanted to thank you for being here and for giving this content your time and attention. I hope you learned something. I can say with certainty, I have learned something with every episode that I have done, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. There's a couple things you can do to help us out. If you want to check out the audio content, we are available on all major podcast platform distributors. And while you're there, give us a five-star review. It helps a lot. And while you're here on YouTube, there's a lot of things you can do to help out as well. It's not going to take very long. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button for this episode, and hit the notification bell. So when we have new content for you, it's going to be at your doorstep ASAP. Lastly, this podcast is created by Debutify, the best Shopify template available. It is 100% free for you to start, and it can change your life. It can make you so much more free than you are right now. So if this episode wasn't enough to convince you, I think a few more might do the trick. So have at it.